Either way, we had nothing to show for six hours' work. The money would go back into the Secret Service Fund. The story you are about to see is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. Sadikoy out in the valley. Yes, sir. Hop out there and take a look at it. The pilot rabbited, but the cargo's still on board. Yes, sir. About 150 pounds of marijuana. Twelve thirty-five a.m. Two radio units were on the scene along with a half a dozen newspaper reporters and photographers. Force and Foothill. Friday and Gannon narcotics. Who informed the press? We figure somebody in the neighborhood. They know about the narcotics? Whoever it was told them that, too. Anybody see the crash? I've got a witness. He's in my car. You want to talk to him? He the one who called the press? No, who claims he didn't? All right, we'll check the plane first. When did it come down? Call came in at three minutes past 12. Witness claims he called as soon as he saw it. AI unit was here at 12.10. Did you check the cargo? That's right. Figured it to be about 150 pounds of weed. Something else. What's that? That brown envelope. Found it under the seat. Heroin. Looks like about $100,000 worth. There's some writing on the envelope in Spanish. Deliver merchandise to same place as last time. 5 a.m. Wednesday. Somebody's going to be awful disappointed at 5 a.m., aren't they? Maybe, maybe not. If we get lucky, we might be able to make this delivery. Only one problem. Where's the drop? We got five hours. Maybe we can find out. 12.47 a.m. While Bill made arrangements with Sergeant Forson for us to take possession of the narcotics, I talked to the reporters. With the discovery of the narcotics and the time element involved, we had a problem. You onto something big, Friday? I need a favor. I want you to sit on the story for a while. Why, Joe? The pilot was probably a mule, a narcotics smuggler. Now, there's about 150 pounds of marijuana and over $100,000 worth of heroin on that plane. We found evidence indicating delivery was to be made in the morning. Now, if the receiver doesn't know the plane went down, he'll be waiting for it. We want to be there. You made the pilot? Sorry, I've told you all I can. Will you hold the story? We need time. How much time? Give us six hours. All right, I think my paper will hold back for one edition. Thanks. I don't have to tell all of you. The department will appreciate it. Call and check with the captain, told him what we had. Fessler's sending a team out from Leighton Prince to check the plane. He's going to wake up somebody in the FAA. He'll call us if he comes up with anything on the plane. Did you talk to the witness? Just did. Not much help. Only thing he could tell us was that the man who left the plane limped. Appeared to favor his right leg. No sign of blood around the plane. Maybe he got off lucky. No other description? Said it was too dark. Couldn't be sure about anything but the limp. Anything else? Yeah. Valley detectives are checking local hospitals. 1K80, this is 321. This is 1K80, go ahead. FAA reports Cessna 140, Nora 17964, is a rental registered to the Fairview Aircraft Company, Van Nuys Airport. Manager's Fred Robertson, I got him out of bed. He's on his way there now. Address is 11862 Airways Boulevard, 321KMA367. Thanks, Fess. 1K80 out. Wayne was a rental. I get a feeling it's going to be a long night. flying school and rental agency. By the 
time we got there, the manager had already arrived. The guy on the phone said one of our planes crashed. Yes, sir, that's right. It was a Cessna 140. The registration number is N17964. Where'd it go down? Near here, over on Santa Coy. Ship totaled? Gears washed out, left wings damaged, props bent. We'd like you to check your records and tell us who the pilot was, if you would. Sure. Anybody hurt? No, not that we know of. There it is. Jerome, Frank T, 2216 South Lancashire, apartment 3D. FAA pilot's license number DN26189. When did he rent the plane? Sunday afternoon. Filed a flight plan for Bly. Apparently he was on his way back. Scheduled return date was Tuesday. You remember what he looked like? No, I didn't pay any attention. I'm not particular. If they got a license and the money, they can get a plane. No scars, tattoos, anything like that? There was one thing. But his license was okay, so I didn't question it. What's that? He had a game leg. He limped. Passenger limped. 
driver remember which way he walked after he dropped him off? Negative. Thanks, Fess. 1K80 KMA. 321 KMA 367. Option two, all the apartments 3D. Three fifteen a.m. In just a little over an hour, Bill and I had checked twelve apartment houses. So far, we turned up nothing but twelve irate citizens. Jim, Jerome Frank. Spell it backwards. Frank Jerome. Might be a coincidence. Worth a try. What was that address we got from the plane rental place? 2216. 2, yeah. Maybe he inverted the last two numbers of his address, too. Get out of here. 
What's going on? Police officer. Your name Jerry Frank? Yeah, that's right. Just keep those hands in plain sight. You're under arrest. I'm not going to cause any trouble. Found this one going out the back door. Name's Pat Wingate. Just put the purse on the floor. I'm not carrying a gun. Put it down. All right, you're under arrest, lady. It's our duty to advise you of your constitutional rights. You have the right to remain silent. Any statements you make can and will be used against you in a court of law. You have the right to the presence of an attorney. If you desire but cannot afford one, one will be appointed before any questioning. Do you understand that? I understand it. Like the Geneva Convention. Name, rank, and serial number. I understand. Do you? Yeah, I suppose. Do you understand? Yes, yes. I'll call Van Eyes for a black and white. If you'll hand me my leg, I'll go peaceably. The sooner you book me, the sooner I can make bail. That's the way you got it figured, have you? That's right. Who are you working for? Sorry? Name, rank, and serial yeah, number. How about you, lady? Where do you fit in? I don't. Don't let the big innocent eyes fool you. She's in it with me. Shut up. You heard your rights. Unit's on its way. All right, fella. You're in big trouble, and you know it. You're supposed to make a delivery at 5 a.m. That's just a little over an hour from now. What do you think's going to happen when you don't show up? Nothing. They'll read about the crash in the newspapers. I call the story in myself. That's my insurance. Yeah, well, your policy just lapsed. We killed the story. In about an hour, your connection's going to figure you've decided to go into business for yourself with $120,000 worth of his merchandise. Now, you like to live dangerously. What do you figure the odds are that you'll still be alive tomorrow night? Mind if I don't believe you? Because I don't. You got about an hour before that phone's going to ring. The man on the other end's going to want his merchandise. He never heard of a plane crash, and you're not in jail. Now you explain that to him. Good luck. Let's go, Gannon. Wait a minute. Yeah? Geneva Convention. I'm a prisoner of war. You gotta lock me up. Wrong war. Who you on the junk for? They'll kill me. I don't know who picks up this stuff, and that's the truth. All right, where? They'll kill me if I tell you. They'll kill you if you don't. Tell him, Jerry. You know what that means? I know what it means if you don't. Out near the Hollywood Dam. Vacant field. I leave the stuff behind some rocks. Next day, they leave my money in the same place. Which rocks? Big one. Two smaller ones in front of it. One of the smaller ones has some writing on it. You put the stuff right behind it. What kind of writing? What's it say? Jesus saves. a.m. We placed the shipment in the location described by the suspect, Jerry Frank. We staked it out with the help of two other teams from Narcotics Division. According to the note found on the plane, the pickup would be made in 18 minutes. Exactly 4.50 a.m., a car headed up the access road to the drop point. There were two men in the front seat. constitutional rights. You don't have to bother with him. What do you mean? He's a dummy. How's that? He was born deaf and dumb. Seven twenty-eight a.m. The two suspects were identified as Peter Whitmer and Wallace Shanklin. We took them to an interrogation room. Good and and I, you've been pretty busy the last few years, haven't you, Whitmer? Talk to my lawyer. You've been in the joint twice for pushing, stayed hospital three times for using, spent a year at Chino for assault while under the influence of narcotics. You've really been the route, haven't you? Talk to my lawyer. You know, you're clean, Shanklin, no record. How does it happen that you're holding hands with a character like Whitmer here? I told you before, he's a dummy. He can't tell you anything. He was born deaf and dumb. How do you communicate with him? Mental telepathy. All right, suppose you tell him then that you're both going to jail. Maybe we are, maybe we're not. In the meantime, the interview is over. 
You got all you're going to get from us. You might as well tell us who the big man is. We'll take him out sooner or later anyway. Ask him. You can make it a lot easier on yourself by telling us what we want to know. How? You going to start toting up my good behavior time right now? Who'd you pick the stuff up for? I don't know, and he can't tell you. How long do you think you can hold out on this deaf and dumb bit? I think you're faking. I think you can hear good and you can talk good. All right, you. Take everything out of your pockets and put it on the table. You're just going to have to reach in and get it while he don't understand you. I don't see why you don't leave him alone. You don't have to rouse the poor guy. He can't hear and he can't talk and you're treating him like a plum. you pick the stuff up for? He couldn't tell you if he wanted to. This says he can. It's a receipt from a music store for two phonograph records. Now, what do you do, Shanklin? Sit there and watch the labels go around? Come on, who are you and what we're working for? I told you it would never work. You stupid jerk. Let's have it. They told me if I was ever picked up just to play deaf and dumb, and since I didn't have nothing on file, they could get me off. All right, who's the big man? I'm gonna tell him. You do that, Fink, and I wouldn't give you eight cents for your future. That's enough of that. Come on, Shanklin. The guy you want is named Sal Romero. He's the one we picked up the stuff for. You really are stupid, aren't you? Why do you say that? You just didn't think, did you? What do you mean? Why didn't you tell him you bought the records for a friend? <laughs> seen is true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On Thursday, November 30th, trial was held in Department 180, Superior Court of the State of California for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial. The suspects were found guilty of conspiracy to violate sections 11501 and 11531 health and safety code state of california which makes it a crime to illegally transport import sell or furnish any narcotic the story you are about to see is true the names have been changed to protect the innocent Thursday, March 13th. It was warm in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of Burglary Auto Theft Division. The boss is Captain Kenneth Green. My partner's Bill Gannon. My name's Friday. Most people think of police officers writing traffic citations, investigating crimes, making arrests, and enforcing the law in general. But his job doesn't end there. Just as important is the officer's appearance in a courtroom as a witness. Without his testimony, there can be no conviction. Several months ago, we had arrested three suspects for burglary from auto. We checked in with Bob Simmons, the deputy district attorney who would prosecute the case. Yes, sir, are you going to bring the comparisons over? Right, I talked to Don Hale about a half an hour ago, told him we'd call him when we need him. We contacted the rest of the witnesses, all except one, this Carl Balanzi, he's out of town. The parking lot attendant. Yeah, according to his mother, his car broke down in Mojave last night on his way home. He said he'd try to make it back in time for the trial, but he hasn't shown up yet. Which reminds me, I better check with the office. He could be on his way over now. Talk to Lieutenant Walters, will you? I told him we'd be checking in. You can use the phone on the bailiff's desk. Right. Well, Sergeant, I think we're in trouble. We need Balanzi's testimony for probable cause. Without it, the defense could get the case thrown out. Yes, sir, I guess there's always that possibility. Didn't you have something in your report about a traffic violation? Yeah, the suspects drove through a red light right after we came out of the parking lot. According to your report, you were about a block away. 
It's thin, but it may be all we have. And it's bound to raise a question of search and seizure. It'd give us probable cause. Dan Mungo's a sharp lawyer. You and your partner could be in for a rough time on Cross. You understand he has a habit of winning his cases. Dan's good. I'd like to have his record. No yeah, luck, Joe. All rise and face the flag. Recognizing the principles for which it stands, Department 121 of the Superior Court of the County of Los Angeles is now in session. The Honorable Birch Donahue, judge presiding. Be seated, please. Please be seated and come to order. Morning, Mr. Simmons. Mr. Mongo, nice to have you with us again. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning, Your Honor. Are counsel ready to proceed with the matter of the people versus Acosta, Williams, and Andrews? The people are ready, Your Honor. Your Honor, the defense is ready. Your Honor, one of the prosecution's witnesses hasn't arrived as yet, Mr. Carl Balanzi. With the court's permission, however, the people are ready to proceed, subject to the stipulation that this witness may be called out of turn. Do you expect him, Mr. Simmons? Yes, Your Honor, I do. Mr. Balanzi went out of town for the weekend and developed car trouble on the way home. His mother expects him at any time. Your Honor, as I understand it, the people's entire case is based on the testimony of Mr. Balanzi. Now, without him, it doesn't appear they're ready to proceed at all. Would the defense be willing to submit the matter on the transcript of the preliminary hearing then, or agree to a continuance until we can produce Mr. Balanzi? Well, the defense could hardly agree to either. In all fairness to the defendants, they are here and ready for trial. Now, if the people are unable to produce this witness, I would ask the court at this time for a dismissal of the charges in this matter, Your Honor. Your Honor, Mr. Balanzi is an essential witness to show probable cause. However, the people are willing to proceed with the case and let the court decide on the matter, based on the evidence offered, with the stipulation that Mr. Balanzi may be heard out of turn. Very well, Mr. Simmons. If you're reasonably sure that your witness will appear, I see no reason he can't be taken out of turn. However, in all fairness, only up to the time the people rest their case. Mr. Mungle, I see from your petition that you wish to try these matters as companion cases. Are you representing all three of the defendants? Yes, Your Honor, I am. The charges alleged in this matter center around the defendants' activities while in each other's company on the night in question. I ask the court to apply the evidence received to all of the defendants equally. Does the district attorney have any objection? Mr. Mungle and I have already discussed the matter, Your Honor. The people have no objection. And may the record show that the defense has agreed to dispense with its right to trial by jury and the reading of the complaint and have agreed to be tried by the court. Defense joins, Your Honor. Let the record so indicate. Very well, Mr. Simmons, you may call your first witness. The people call Dr. Jack Patterson. Raise your right hand, please. Do you solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give in the matter now pending before this court is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Is Jack Patterson your true name? Yes. Be seated, please. Dr. Patterson, are you a dentist here in Los Angeles? Yes, sir. The doctor, would you please tell the court where you were on the evening of December 14th of last year? Yes, I was at the sports center that night. My two boys and I went there to see a basketball game. Did you drive your car that evening, sir? Yes, I drove my car. And where did you park your car when you arrived at the sports center? Across the street in the parking lot near Santa Barbara and Figueroa. Did you lock your car that night, doctor? Yes, I did. I remember locking it because my older boy's always kidding me about forgetting to take the keys out of the ignition. I see. Now tell me, doctor, did you notice anything different about your car when you returned to it that evening after the game? I sure did. The window on the driver's side had been broken out. Was there anything missing from your car? Yes, there was. My stereo was gone, and about a dozen or more tapes were missing from the glove compartment. Did you report this fact to the police? I started to, but Mrs. Chambers had already called them, and they were on the way. Her car wound had been broken, too. Thank you, Doctor. Nothing further, Your Honor. Mr. Mungo? No questions, Your Honor. The witness is excused. Your Honor, the people call Mrs. Gloria Chambers. Now then, Mrs. Chambers, you say when you came back to your car, you found the window on the driver's side had been broken. I did not say it had been broken, young man. I said it had been smashed. Yes, ma'am. And had you locked your car that evening? Of course I locked it. I always lock my car. I read the posters put out by the police department. Mrs. Chambers, did you report the fact that your car window had been smashed to the police? You know very well I did, young man. The two officers who came out are sitting right there beside you. And exactly what was it you reported to the officers? I told them just what happened that someone, or some group of people, had been going around smashing the windows out of innocent people's cars. It was shocking. You would think that those young men would have more consideration for someone else's property. Are you referring to the officers? Of course not. Those three men over there, they did it. Your Honor. Sustained. Witness last remark will be stricken from the record. I have nothing further, Your Honor. 
You wish to cross-examine, Mr. Bungle? No questions, Your Honor. Witness is excused. Thank you, Judge. Gentlemen, it's noon. If there are no objections, I think this is a good place to recess. No objection, Your Honor. No objection. Very well, then. This court's recessed till 1.30 this afternoon. Well, now, looks like you people are having a bit of bad luck. That witness of yours hasn't shown up. Yeah. Well, it's time for lunch. Or aren't you gentlemen eating today? At 1.30 p.m. when the trial of Ray Acosta, Marvin Williams, and Robert Andrews reconvened. During the noon recess, Bill and I drove out to the Balanzi residence in West Los Angeles. Carl still had not returned home. He had called his mother again from Mojave to tell her that his car was overheating, but he would do his best to get back to Los Angeles as soon as possible. Sergeant Friday, will you tell the court what your assignment is, please? Yes, sir. I'm assigned to Burglary Auto Theft Division. And were you so assigned on the night of December 14th of last year? Yes, sir, I was. Will you please tell the court what you were doing and where you were on that night? Officer Gannon and I were working the night watch on special assignment out of Burglary Auto Theft Division. We'd received a call that evening that several burglaries had been committed in one of the parking lots near the sports center. We went there to investigate. And where were you at approximately 11.40 that same evening? We had just left the parking lot near the intersection of Santa Barbara Avenue and Figueroa Street. Was this the same parking lot described earlier by the witnesses we've already heard? Yes, sir. Sergeant, will you tell the court exactly what happened when you and Officer Gannon left the lot? Did you have an occasion to see the defendants at that time? Yes, sir, I did. As we pulled out onto Santa Barbara Avenue, I noticed a light blue 1968 Chevrolet just ahead of us in the number three lane approaching Figueroa Street. The signal light for the east-west traffic was red at the time. The Chevrolet made a right turn onto Figueroa without coming to a complete stop as required by section 21453 of the vehicle code. Did you pull the car over at that time? We attempted to stop the car by displaying a red light and sounding our horn, but it wasn't until approximately four blocks later that it finally pulled over to the curb. And during that four blocks, did you notice anything going on inside the car that aroused your suspicion? Yes, sir, I did. It appeared that one of the occupants seated in the rear was attempting to hide something on the floor. Objection! Your Honor, the answer calls for a conclusion on the part of the witness as to what appeared to be taking place in the rear of the car. Now, he was obviously some distance away, and his vision was restricted to the area of the rear window. This would hardly qualify such a broad assumption on his part. Sergeant Friday, could you be more specific as to what it was you actually saw? Yes, Your Honor. I saw what appeared to be Defendant Andrews attempting to conceal something on the floor. He kept glancing back at us out of the rear window and then ducking down out of sight. When he finally settled back in the seat, Costa pulled to the curb. Did you base this conclusion on your experience as a police officer, Sergeant? Yes, Your Honor. Did you, in fact, find something concealed on the rear floor of the vehicle at the subsequent time? Yes, sir, I did. Objection overruled. You may proceed, Mr. Simmons. Sergeant, did you or Officer Gannon approach the defendant's car first? I was the first one out. I approached the driver's side and identified myself as a police officer. And what did you observe at that time? I observed the three defendants in the car. Acosta was driving, Williams was seated in the right front, Andrews was in the back. Did you have an occasion to look on the rear floor where you saw the suspicious activity going on? Your Honor, if it pleases the court, the defense objects to Mr. Simmons' last question. His reference to suspicious activity is pure supposition and does not even reflect the words of the witness. And in any event, Your Honor, has certainly not been established as fact. Your Honor, I think it's perfectly clear what the officer meant when he referred to what he saw through the rear window of the defendant's car. The fact that he investigated the rear floor certainly indicates that he was suspicious of something. Will the reporter go back and read the officer's statement with regard to what he observed prior to the defendant's vehicle being stopped? Mr. Simmons, and during that four blocks, did you notice anything going on inside the car that aroused your suspicion? Sergeant Friday, yes, sir, I did. It appeared that one of the occupants seated in the rear was attempting to hide something on the floor. Thank you. The objection to Mr. Simmons' last question is sustained. Will you rephrase your question, please, and proceed? Very well, Your Honor. Sergeant Friday, did you look on the rear floor of the car? Yes, sir, I did. And will you please tell the court what you found there, if anything? I observed a man's cloth jacket partially concealing what appeared to be an iron rod. Please continue, Sergeant. After I told the defendants to get out of the car, I removed the jacket and observed two lug wrenches partially concealed under the rear of the front seat. And did you personally inspect the victim's vehicles in the parking lot that night, Sergeant? I did. And in your opinion, as an experienced police officer, could the windows of those vehicles have been broken out by the lug wrenches? Objection, Your Honor. The answer calls for a conclusion. Overruled. You may answer the question, Sergeant. Yes, sir. 
It was a heavy object that broke the windows, possibly a lug wrench. Thank you, Sergeant Friday. Nothing further, Your Honor. Mr. Mungo, you wish to cross-examine this witness? Thank you, Your Honor. Sergeant Friday, did you ask Mr. Acosta why he was carrying the two lug wrenches in the passenger compartment of his car? Yes, sir, I did. And did he tell you that he was carrying them there to check the lug nuts on his wheels from time to time because on a previous occasion, someone had attempted to remove those wheels without his knowledge and that he nearly had an accident? Yes, sir, he said that someone was trying to steal his mag wheels and that he scared them off. Now then, did you tell him that he should keep the wrenches in the trunk compartment of his car and not in the passenger compartment where they could easily be mistaken for weapons? Yes, sir, I did. And he replied, did he not, that he could not put the wrenches in the trunk because earlier that evening he had loaned his car to a friend and when the keys were returned to him, the trunk key was missing. Yes, sir, that's what he said. And that made you suspicious, did it, Sergeant? No, sir, not really. Not until my partner found the missing trunk key in the suspect's pocket. Sergeant Friday, did you have a conversation with anyone in the parking lot other than the victims? Yes, sir. We spoke to the parking lot attendant. Isn't it a fact that he told you, for whatever reason, to be on the lookout for a car resembling that of the defendant's? Yes, sir. He described the defendant's car to us. Then when you and your partner left the parking lot, you were looking for a specific make, year, and color of automobile. Isn't that correct? It is. Then isn't it possible when you saw the defendant's car, it so nearly resembled the car described to you and you were so intent on locating such a vehicle that you were mistaken about the alleged violation? And, in fact, the car did stop for the red light. But you felt you needed a reason to pull it over? Now, isn't that correct? No, sir, that is not correct. We saw the car slow down at the corner. We had a clear, unobstructed view. It did not stop. From a block away. Oh, I must say, Sergeant, I think the police department is wasting your talents. You should be working in the traffic division. Tell me, Sergeant, you were in a plainclothes unit, an unmarked car, were you not? Yes, sir, I was. And is it common practice when you're in such a vehicle for you to take enforcement action against traffic violations? No, sir, it's not. Thank you, Sergeant. That'll be all. You may step down. Three o five p.m. Don Hale of SID was notified to come over to testify. Bill took the stand to tell the part he played in the arrest of the three defendants. Officer Gannon, I show you two common lug wrenches, the kind furnished with most of the new cars nowadays, and I ask if you can identify them. Yes, sir. They're the same two Sergeant Friday found sticking out from under the rear of the front seat of the defendant's car. They both have my initials scratched in them right there. Your Honor, may these items be marked People's 4 and 5 for identification. They may be so marked. Thank you, Your Honor. I have nothing further. Now, Officer Gannon, we've already heard Sergeant Friday testify that it was he who went up to the defendant's car first and told him to get out. Where were you at that time? Standing on the curb between the two cars. And did the defendants join you there? Yes, sir, they did. I had them stand where I could keep an eye on them while my partner checked the car out. You not only had them stand where you could keep an eye on them, but you searched them at that point, did you not? Yes, sir, as I recall, that's when I patted them down. Had you placed the defendants under arrest prior to patting them down, as you put it? Uh, no, sir, not at that time. We didn't arrest them until after we found the stolen stereotapes and tape deck in the trunk of the car. Then the defendants were not under arrest at the time you searched them? No, sir, they weren't. Your Honor, the purpose of this line of questioning is to show the court the flagrant and wanton disregard the officers held for the rights of these defendants. Not only by searching their person prior to any arrest, but also by conducting an illegal search of their vehicle. Did Gannon search them for weapons? Yes, sir, they were clean. The court has taken note of the testimony that's been presented, Mr. Mongol. However, it must be remembered the hour was late. Officer Gannon, was the purpose of your search to determine whether or not the defendants were armed? Yes, Your Honor, it was. The officers had the right to protect themselves under such circumstances, Mr. Mongol. As for the search of the vehicle, I think we should hear the rest of the testimony. You may continue, Mr. Mongo. Isn't it a fact that you're also looking for something else when you searched Mr. Acosta? I don't think I understand the question, Mr. Mongo. Well, let me put it this way. Did you find any weapons on the defendants when you searched them? No, sir, I didn't. But isn't it a fact that you did find the key to the trunk compartment of the defendant's car during that search? The same key Mr. Acosta honestly believed had not been returned to him. Yes, sir, I found the key, all right, but that's not what I was looking for. Well, tell me, officer, did you find anything either on the defendant's persons or in the passenger compartment of their car that was later proven to be stolen property? No, sir. Thank you, officer. Nothing further, Your Honor. 3.45 p.m., while Don Hale from Scientific Investigation Division took the stand, Bill called Mrs. Balanzi again. Carl still wasn't home. Our time was running out. Now, Mr. Hale, we've heard your qualifications as an expert chemist. Will you tell the court what kind of test you made? Yes, sir. I performed six comparison tests in all. Three on the glass fragments found adhering to the beveled edge here. Uh, let the record show the witness is pointing to the sharp edge of People's Four for identification, the part that would normally be used to remove hubcaps. And three more comparisons on the black paint samples that were taken from the broken windows of the victim's vehicles. Were you able to form a conclusion based on your findings? I was. 
And would you please tell the court what that conclusion is? As a result of the examinations described, I found that there was no appreciable difference noted in the samples compared. The glass fragments taken from people's four and five and the paint samples found on the broken window glass definitely indicate that these two instruments, or two exactly like them, were used to break the windows of the victim's vehicles. Thank you, Mr. Hale. No further questions, Your Honor. Mr. Mungo? No questions, Your Honor. Witness is excused. Call your next witness, Mr. Simmons. Your Honor, as you know, the people intended to call Mr. Balanzi to the stand at this time, but I'm afraid he's not arrived in court as yet. The officers have talked with his mother, and she indicated to them that he left the town of Mojave shortly after noon today en route to Los Angeles. That's only a little over 100 miles from here, and he should arrive here at any minute. Your Honor, it seems to me that the prosecution has had ample time to present its case. The defense moves at this time that they either present this witness of theirs or allow the defense to present its side of the case without further delay. I think it's quite clear, Your Honor, from the testimony of the prosecution's own witnesses, namely the two officers involved in the arrest, that the defendant's constitutional rights were violated. The people have failed to show probable cause for stopping the defendants in the first place, basing this part of its case on an obscure traffic violation admittedly witnessed from a full city block away. And then, as if to compound this injustice, the defendants' rights were further violated when an illegal search was made, both of their person and their vehicle. One of you better give Valanzi another try. I can hold Mungle off for a few more minutes, maybe get us another recess. Your Honor, if it pleases the court, the people ask for a short recess at this time to see if Mr. Balanzi can be located. One of the officers has gone to call his home again. We should know in a few minutes whether or not he's returned. Your Honor, as I have just stated, the people have had more than enough time to present their case. Another recess would only serve to delay these proceedings. There is an alternative, Your Honor. I have here the original police report made by the officers at the time of the arrest. It contains the statement given to them by Mr. Balanzi on that night. I ask the court to allow that statement to be read into the record only for the purpose of establishing probable cause and subject to being struck at a later time when Mr. Balanzi can be produced. Your Honor, such a request is impossible. It violates the fundamental principles of the rules of evidence. A defendant before the court is entitled to be confronted by all witnesses offering evidence against him. Gentlemen, you both presented a good argument that's placed the court in somewhat of a dilemma. The court has heard strong evidence that a crime has been committed, and it appears that Mr. Balanzi will be able to shed some light on who committed the crime. The court cannot, in good conscience, ignore this fact and would not hesitate to allow the defense similar latitude should it find itself in this circumstance. Court recess for 10 minutes. Four twenty-two p.m. Court was still in recess. There was no answer at the Balanzi residence. We called Lieutenant Walters at burglary auto theft, but there'd been no messages from Carl Balanzi or his mother. We would still try to reach the witness, but we were just about out of time. Any word? The officer will keep trying his house. They sent a team out to check around outside just to be sure. And? No luck, Bob. Let's face it, Balanzi's not going to show. Mr. Simmons, is the district attorney ready to proceed? Your Honor, I'm afraid we've been unable to contact our witness at this time. The people rest. Your Honor, at this time, the defense moves for a dismissal. The charges brought against the defendants Ray Acosta, Marvin Williams, and Robert Andrews should be dismissed for lack of evidence and failure of the prosecution to show probable cause. From the evidence presented, the court feels the officers acted within the scope of their authority by stopping the defendants' car as they did. During this time, one of the officers testified that he noted something suspicious going on in the back of the car. This gave him the right to determine to his own satisfaction what that suspicious activity was. The officers also had the right to protect themselves by searching the defendants for weapons. However, without additional evidence on the part of the prosecution, it appears to the court that the officer's duty ended there. Under normal circumstances, the officers would not have confiscated the lug wrenches, even though it appeared that one of the defendants had tried to hide them. And the search of the defendants' persons was for the purpose of discovering whether or not they were armed, and not for the trunk key they ultimately found. Therefore, gentlemen, it is the decision of this court that any evidence obtained beyond that point is inadmissible. The court is forced to grant your request, Mr. Mungle. Case dismissed.
the story you have just seen is true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. In a moment, the conclusion. Raymond Acosta, Marvin Williams, and Robert Andrews were exonerated of all charges. Six months later, Tuesday, March 8th. We were working the day watch out of narcotics division. The boss is Captain Tremblay. My partner is Bill Gannon. My name's Friday. Detectives Whitney and Ellenson had just returned from field duty. They didn't look too happy. You two working airport detail, is that it? Nothing. Ten pounds of air. You guys know what it's like out there. You can stake the place for a month and come up empty. Sometimes even if you're working on a tip. We know for a fact that Hardy is shipping pot through the airport. But go prove it. Go find the stuff. You don't even know where to begin looking. Frustration can get you. You know the junk is going out all around you and you got no way to stop it. We're not telling you guys anything new. You know the feeling. You stand there in the freight area wishing you had x-ray vision. You just feel so stinking useless. Yeah. You feel like you're not earning your pay. There's got to be an answer. Yeah, there is, Whit, but we don't seem to have it. Ten oh five a.m. Captain Tremblay wanted to see us concerning a piece of equipment he'd asked us to check out. Come on in, and have a seat. How'd it go? We tried it. It doesn't work. Much problem. You can only use a fluoroscope to detect metal objects. A marijuana it isn't metal. Well, granted, it's sometimes wrapped in foil. So is your Aunt Bertha's fruitcake. Any suggestions? All right, now look. You and I both know that a vast majority of all the marijuana in this country passes right through L.A. here. How do we stop it? How do we find it? Well, we've still got our informants working. That's not good enough. In the next few months, they start harvesting the stuff, and it gets shipped out by the ton right here through L.A. There's got to be some way to detect it. How? We're not dogs. We can't sniff it out. Dogs. What's that? Bill just said it. How about training a dog to do it? Joe, that's the craziest thing I've... Wait a minute. That's not so crazy. Maybe it's not. Where do we start? Where else? The yellow pages. Displays. Distillers. Here we go. Dog kennels. Those continental canines, they've got a big ad. Sentry dogs. Won't hurt to try. That's our problem, Mr. Busing. We need a pot sniffer. Is there such an animal? Not yet, I'm afraid. Is it possible to train a dog for the job? I've heard somebody in Israel did. That right. I haven't heard of it. But quite frankly, Captain, I think the right dog can be trained to do just about anything. On the other hand, no one I know of has ever tried to train a dog to track down marijuana before. Seems to me the right dog could do it, maybe. How long would it take to train the dog? After the first problem is solved, I'd say that in three months you'd know one way or the other if the dog could do it for you. The first problem, finding the right dog. It's a sense you can't run an ad. <laughs> I wish it were that simple. To find him, you have to look for a dog with the proper aptitude. We can start tomorrow out of my kennel. We've got some 400 candidates for the job. Uh, just one thing, I'll need some marijuana. We'll never know if the dog can find this stuff if he doesn't know what he's looking for. How much will you need? Oh, just a small amount. Teach him the scent. Okay. Joe, use some of the stuff we booked as found evidence. Ask Central to assign somebody to be the carrier. Yes, sir. Mr. Busing, thanks for your help. Don't thank me. I've got teenage kids of my own. I wish I could guarantee results. I wish to God I could. But I can't. We understand. We'll hold a good thought. Thursday, March 24th. Nearly three weeks went by. Narcotics Friday? Yeah, that's right. Well, that's good news. In about 30 minutes. Right. We'll see you then. It was Bob Busey. Yeah? He's got the field narrowed down to three dogs. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. Good morning. This is Gene Jalbert, my chief handler. How are you? Nice meeting you. Glad to see you. 
How's it look? Well, we've tested out nearly 100 dogs. These three have shown the best aptitude. But you never know how quickly a dog will get bored with a new trick. How are they on detection? That's what we come to now. So far, we've only hidden the bag. This time, we've tried to conceal the scent of the marijuana. The burlap bag is in the dry grass over there. The marijuana is wrapped in two layers of cellophane, a layer of tinfoil, and thick wrapping paper, and then placed in the bag. Well, I guess we're ready to begin. Our first candidate is Igor. I'll get the 30-foot lead. Igor, sit. Igor, seek. Seek, boy, seek. Come on, Igor, seek. Sure, wild dog, isn't it? Yeah. Seek, boy. He doesn't look like he's got the idea. Wolfie, seek. Seek, Wolfie. Wolfie, seek. Seek, boy, seek. Make a good trick, dog, wouldn't it? <laughs> Stay. Hoshi, that's it, that's it. Hoshi, seek. Hoshi, seek, boy. Hoshi, Hoshi, seek. Come on, Hoshi, seek. I don't suppose you fellas need a good dependable grass scratcher, do you? Well, we'll keep looking. These aren't all the dogs in the world. They're just all the dogs we have on hand. Well, we sure appreciate your trying, and we can see you've done that. Maybe we're asking too much. It just seemed like a good idea. Oh, it's still a good idea. Somewhere, Sergeant, there's a dog who can do the job for you. What about the German Shepherd? She's got a cold, hasn't she? She's up and around today. Go get her, will you please, Gene? It's worth a try. We've got one other dog who hasn't been tested yet. It's a German Shepherd bitch who was down with a cold the other day when we were running the rest of the animals through. We've got the time if you have. I'm not promising anything. You saw how those others behave, and this one doesn't have any idea what we want. What are the odds, 100 to 1? About that, yeah. Come on, girl. Ginger, sit. This is Ginger. Feeling better, girl? Over your cold? How's your sense of smell? Ginger, seek. Seek, Ginger. Come on, girl, go find it. Where is it? Where is it? Good girl. Drop it. Good girl. Got ourselves a dog. Gentlemen, a new breed and a rare one. One of a kind. A pot smelling dog. Must be for you, Joe. How do you figure? It's closer to your chair. Barco dog food. Some wise guy. Be careful, Gannon. That's your lunch. I wonder if they'll sit up for it. Mark. It's been three months, Mr. Busing. What's the word? 
The dog's good, Captain. She's awfully good. Joe, Bill? I've seen her in action, and I'm impressed. I'll go along with Joe. Well, that's encouraging, but you know the problem we're up against with the courts on something like this. Probable cause. What's that? Well, Bill and I have faith in Ginger, but unless the courts are convinced beyond the shadow of a doubt of her reliability, it won't matter how much pot she uncovers, we won't be able to bring the marijuana into court as evidence. We have to convince any judge that Ginger is so absolutely trustworthy that they'll grant us search warrants on her say-so alone. Only that way can we use in court the evidence she uncovers. I see. Uh, how do you go about convincing the courts? Well, they have to hold a demonstration. The sooner the better, and it better be good. Where and when? Well, since Ginger would do most of her work at the airport, we've arranged with the Flying Tigers airline to test her at their warehouse. It's about as big as a football field and packed with freight. When? Day after tomorrow too soon? Good. Bob, have you got Ginger with you by any chance? Sure do. She's downstairs in the station wagon. Would you mind bringing her up? Our chemist has set up a test we'd like to have her take. Oh? What kind of test, Captain? Well, all I've been hearing is how good that dog is. She is. I'll guarantee it. You won't have to if she passes this test. are 16 different substances. Only one of them is marijuana, but the other 15 are similar enough in appearance and odor to confuse experts. We also have a plate of dog food. That was Captain Tremblay's idea. That's plate 10. The number I'm interested in is 13. Ginger, see. She can read. What's that? I don't know, but this time it's for you. It's closer to your chair. Mason, you wouldn't happen to know what's in this box, would you? No. All I know is it was delivered by a French poodle 20 minutes ago. How could you tell? You two wouldn't know a French poodle from a fox terrier. With best wishes and much hope for continued success, love, Lassie. Stupid dog. Look at that, Joe. Success with one C. <laughs> oh, it's a choo-choo bone. Gentlemen, in the event some of you don't know the exact reason I've invited you down here, let me explain that you're about to see a demonstration. Now, you're all aware of the problem we're up against in the detection of marijuana. The dealers do a pretty good job of disguising the packaging or concealment. Now, with thousands upon thousands of boxes, cartons, and parcels passing through our airports, bus terminals, and shipping port, it's virtually impossible to stop the flow of marijuana. Or rather, I should say it was virtually impossible. We feel we've come up with a solution. I'll ask Sergeant Joe Friday here to take over at this point. Gentlemen, this is Mr. Robert Busing. His friend's name is Ginger, a three-year-old German shepherd. We believe she's the solution Captain Tremblay made reference to. Now, we've had the warehouseman here hide five boxes for us among the several hundred you see around you. Five boxes. Even we don't know exactly where they are. Inside of each of the five boxes is a relatively small quantity of marijuana. Some of it processed, some of it unprocessed. It's all been wrapped in plastic, tinfoil, and wax paper. It's then been packed in three separate airtight boxes, one inside the other. Bob? Ginger, seek.
In less than 10 minutes, gentlemen, that dog located every single one of the concealed packages containing the contraband. A pretty amazing accomplishment, I think you'll agree. Now, I... Captain Tremblay. Yes, Your Honor. I understood you concealed five packages, is that correct? Yes, sir, that is correct. Do you have any idea of what the dog is after in that wood pile? Uh, no, Your Honor, I do not. Granted that up to now, your dog has performed with alacrity. But if the animal reverts to its normal instinct, seeking out items other than what she's intended to, well, I have to tell you that the bench would find itself hard put to issue a search warrant. In other words, the bench would have no way of knowing in advance whether she was getting excited over a shipment of marijuana or a package of dog biscuits. Blows your probable cause sky high, doesn't it? Yes, sir, it looks that way, Your Honor. says on this envelope, property of Chief of Detectives Houghton. That belongs to me, Al. I hid this item earlier this morning. Inside this sealed envelope are just two grams of marijuana. I wanted to see how good that dog really is. Now, speaking for myself, I have no doubts at all that this dog would be invaluable to the department. What happens now? Now we wait for the decision. How do you think it'll go? Well, it's a matter of search and seizure, Bob. You see, according to law, airlines have the legal right to open any package they carry. However, if Ginger lets us know there's marijuana in a particular package, and after we obtain a search warrant, we can open that package and confiscate the contraband. But unless the courts have enough faith in Ginger's talents to grant us that search warrant on her say-so alone, we can't use the contraband to convict the drug peddlers. So now we wait. Now we wait. Well, what do you know? Sergeant Preston and his fearless dog, King. Woof, woof. Hey, Gannon, do you get a disability allowance if you come down with fleas? Haven't you heard? He's trading his gun in on the flea collar. <laughs> Where have you two been? We've been looking all over for you. Wanted you to meet the new member of the team. Well, Young said hello. Woof, woof. While you were playing dog trainer, we were out making a bust. A good one, too. Is that right? Ginger, come. Who's holding? Ginger, seek. Wait a minute. What's going on here? You guys ought to sign this dog on with the pickpocket details. She's a natural. What do you got in that pocket? Nothing, officer. Just my car keys and some small change. What else? Evidence. What sort of evidence? I'm going to book it. Well, now, in your report, what are you going to call your evidence? <clears throat> Marijuana. I didn't hear you. Marijuana. Two weeks, Captain. Any word? Come on in. I'm just about to call you. Just heard from Judge Manson. He says they'll have an answer for us in 24 hours. Yes, sir. Go or no go? He didn't say. But I got a feeling that a little nudge might not do any harm. And you can't blame the bench. They need all the ammunition they can get to help the legalistics fall into place. Yes, sir. The dog's a new wrinkle. Now, let's crack it from another angle. We know that the dog will get the job done at the airport. Let's show them how good she is at a private residence. What do you have in mind? Just heard from Mason and Young. They're out in the field at that Orchard Street address. Pork Hardy and Charlie Anderson? Every team in the division's had a go at it, and they've all come up empty. Yes, sir. We know they're receiving at the airport. Our dogs should be able to prove that. Agreed. But let's take a shot at putting the frosting on the cake. Let's nail them for possession in their home. Probable cause we don't need. Mason and Young got a search warrant. They're shaking the place now. Hop out there and introduce them to Ginger. Just one thing, Skipper. What's that, Gannon? We've never worked her in a private residence, and you know how much luck we've had with Hardy and Anderson. None of us have turned as much as a seed. Let's go for broken. Yes, sir. As far as Ginger's concerned, let's win it all or lose it all. Joe, what are you doing here? I just came out to give you a hand. We could sure use it. We've shaken the place from top to bottom. Can't turn a thing. We know they're holding. What do you say, Friday? You come out to hunt Easter eggs with the boys? Maybe. Pork, do you know what these people are looking for? Something called weed, I think. That we ain't got. But there's some salami in the refrigerator. All right, that's enough of the mouthing off. Just sit quiet. Did you cover everything? With a fine-toothed comb. Yeah, we know they got junk here someplace. 
They're still peddling to the high school kids three blocks over. Four of the kids fingered the place this time. Listen to how they accuse us, Charlie. We pay their salaries, offer to share our salami with them, and they accuse us. Sweet, aren't they? We told you to tuck in that mouth, didn't we? Kitchen, bathroom, bedrooms, closets, nothing. That stuff's got to be here somewhere. Go ahead, Friday. You tell them where it is. We don't know what you're looking for, but go ahead. Be a good goon. Tell them where it is. I brought along a friend who might just do that, fella. Good for you, Friday. Good. Good for you, Friday. Bring all your friends. We'll have a party. Bill. Well, looky there, Charlie. A cop with a seeing eye dog. Ginger, seek. Seek her. That dog better be housebroker. We'll sue. Come on, girl. See. Where is it? Where is it? You know something, Charlie? What's that? I bet that mutt would like some of our salami. Come on, girl. Come on, girl. Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Good girl. What are you looking for there? Salami. We told you once the salami's in the refrigerator. We'll settle for sausage. Five bricks and one lid. food in the bone. What about him? You still got him? I think so. Good. I'm ready to eat him. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the division, Ginger. The story you have just seen is true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On September 8th, trial was held in Department 184, Superior Court of the State of California for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial. The suspects were tried and convicted of violation of the State Health and Safety Code, Section 11530.5, possession for sale of marijuana. The penalty prescribed by law is imprisonment in the state prison for not less than two years, nor more than 10 years. Thanks to Ginger, the traffic in marijuana has decreased sharply the past year in big cities all over the country. intention method. The what? The paradox intention method. You mean you never heard of it? <laughs> oh, I can't say as I have. It's very scientific. It's a new method of curing insomnia. What's with the arms? Oh, well, see, you raise your left arm like this. Then you say, my arm is heavy, heavy, heavy. And then you raise your right arm like this, and you say, my arm... Oh, that isn't necessary. I'm not going to do it now, Joe. Then you raise your left leg, and your right leg, and around the clock. And then what happens? I just told you, pretty soon your arms and legs get heavier and heavier, and the next thing you know, you're sound asleep. Well, let me ask you one thing. Sure. 
You just got to work, pal. How come you're trying to go to sleep? Well, that's where the paradox intention comes in. The theory is that if you try to go to sleep, you'll stay awake and vice versa. I see. That's why it's called the paradox intention method. That's why it's called that. If you try to do one thing, you'll do just the opposite. It's a paradox, Joe. Does it work? For sure it works. It's very scientific, you know. Then how come you're yawning? You should have had a good night's sleep. Didn't you try your method last night? Oh, yeah. I tried it. Didn't work, huh? No, it worked fine. The only trouble was it took all night to make it work. Two people shot. Man and a woman. Draft code printing plan in West Vernon. SID's on the way. Right. Looks like a sniper. 9.22 a.m. Grafco is a big plant in the May Park area. They print weekly newspapers and big circulation magazines. The payroll is about 200. 9.37 a.m. We arrived at Grafco. The personnel manager showed us the employment records of both victims. Fred Keller was a foreman, a family man. He got along with everybody. Barbara Hill was a secretary. She was well liked. She had a fiance overseas in the Air Force. 9.40 a.m. We talked to Frank Romero, the plant manager. He knew of no reason why anyone might have wanted to kill either of the victims. There were no witnesses. It appeared both victims were entering the building when they were shot. You don't know of any quarrels the victims might have had, any bad blood with the other employees? No, none. I can't believe anybody who works here could do a thing as horrible as this. Mr. Romero, we'd like to have the names of any of your employees who didn't show up for work this morning. Well, you think it was one of my employees? It's a place to start. Yes, of course. I'll get the time sheets. Thank you. I tell you, this has me all shook up. Two people shot down in cold blood. I suppose you people see a lot of this sort of thing. You're used to it. No, sir. You never get used to it. Frank Romero came up with the names of six absentees. We checked them out. They all could account for their whereabouts at the time of the double murder. There was nothing to do now but begin the tedious job of checking out every man and woman on the Grafco payroll. We worked all day and into the night. Wednesday, 10.05 a.m. Bill and I checked back in after a short night's sleep. We had worked half the night at Grafco without turning a single lead. The bodies of both shooting victims were posted. Two slugs were removed from the male victim's head and one from an almost identical location in the female victim. The slugs were sent up to ballistics for identification. Captain, Joe. Ballistics report, murder weapon was a 22 caliber rifle. Homicide Helder. Here for you, Joe. Thank you. This Friday. Yes, sir. I see. Uh-huh. All right, thank you, Mr. Romero. We're on our way. It's one of the foremen out at Grafco. He remembers a beef between the male victim, Fred Keller, and some kid, a college boy who works part-time. Yeah. The kid didn't show up for work yesterday, but nobody bothered to mark it down. 10.28 a.m. The foreman was named Al Souza. He said the boy who didn't show up Tuesday morning was named Jeff Buckram, 18 years old, a student at May Park Junior College. He's kind of a flunky, Sergeant. He only works part-time when he hasn't got a class in college, and nobody remembered it was his day on, I guess. You say he had a quarrel with Keller. It wasn't much, hardly anything. Two weeks ago, the kid fired up one of the big rotary presses. He's not supposed to even touch it. Keller jumped him, not too hard. Kid had it coming. It's dangerous fooling around with a big press like that. But the kid blew. He sort of turned white-like and doubled up his fist and started moving at Keller. What happened then? Nothing. One or two of the boys told him to cool it, and Keller just shrugged and said, take it easy, kid, or something like that. And that was it? Yeah, Keller walked away. Kid just stood there with his knuckles white, and everybody left him alone. All right, thank you, Mr. Sousa. Well, I'm sorry, Sergeant, about not remembering yesterday, I mean. Kid like that, nobody ever seems to miss him. Maybe that's what he didn't like. 10.42 a.m., we drove over to May Park Junior College. 11.03 a.m., we checked with the registrar. Jeff Buckram was scheduled for an English class from 10 to 11 a.m. We decided to talk to his instructor. His English teacher was Ann Tipton. Oh, you didn't miss Jeff. He was absent today. I knew something must be wrong. Why do you say that, Miss Tipton? He's never absent. What is it anyway? What's Jeff done? Would you know the names of any of his friends? No, Jeff spends most of his time alone. He's a very dedicated student, perhaps too dedicated. How's that, Miss Tipton? It's just a phase he's in, I suspect. He's a very sensitive young man, rather a poet. He's trying very hard to be an existentialist at the moment. He's 18, but he's still an adolescent. 
It's not a very good combination, adolescence and existentialism. What do you mean by existentialism? If you don't know, don't worry, Mr. Gannon. Nobody else knows either. It's sort of an anti-philosophy, really. Existentialists don't agree with each other about anything, even about being existentialists. But they do seem to have one thing in common. What's that? I'd say they're preoccupied with the darker side of life. The darker side? Meaning what, Miss Tipton? Oh, aggression, violence, fear, death. And there's one sort of central thing. What's that? They believe one should live one's philosophy, not just think about it. Yes, ma'am. One must act. a.m., Jeff Buckram lived in a small two-story apartment with the usual palm trees out front. A weary-looking woman answered the door. She said she was Jeff Buckram's aunt, Ada Beale. We identified ourselves, and she asked us in. What you want with Jeff? He's never had any trouble with the police. You want to ask him some questions? Well, he's in his room with his nose in the book, as usual. I've raised that boy since his folks was killed eight years ago, but I never taught him to read trash like that. As God is my judge, I didn't. What kind of trash is that, Miss Beale? Flowers of evil, that's what it is. Baudelaire, you should hear him spout that stuff. It's profane, if you ask me, enough to drive the Lord right out of this house. Aunt Ada thinks that all literature stops with the Bible. Anything else is blasphemous. Uh, are you cops? Jeff Buckram. That's right. What have I done? Did Aunt Ada turn me in for reading Baudelaire? This is Officer Gannon. My name's Friday, Los Angeles Police Department. We're investigating a shooting at the Grafco plant yesterday morning. Two people killed. Yes, I heard about it on the radio. Aunt... Ada's radio. I hate radios myself all day long, that hideous outpouring of vulgarity. You weren't at work yesterday morning, Jeff. You mind telling us where you were? Right here in my room. With my friend Flaubert. Flaubert? Oh, yes. Flaubert. It's another one of them flowers of evil. You know Flaubert, officer? A passing of Queens. Well, this is where I was all day yesterday. Right here, deep in the cesspools of French literature. Can you verify that, Mrs. Beale? No, not directly, I can't. I wasn't home. But he was here, all right. Jeff never lies, even if his mind is poisoned against the Lord. I was at work. I'm a housekeeper odd days. It's the only kind of work the Lord fitted me to do. Any special reason why you didn't go to work yesterday or to school today? I I'm in pain. Is that so? Yes, I took a line drive on the shin Monday. Baseball practice. I'm a pitcher. College team? That's right. May Park Junior College Pirates. <laughs> now, how is that for vulgarity? We understand you knew Fred Keller, is that right? That scum, illiterate scum. Oh, God forgive us. Now you see what I mean, officers. We understand you had a quarrel with Fred Keller two weeks ago. Tell us about it. A quarrel? You switched down one of the presses you weren't supposed to touch, isn't that it? Keller was arrogant. All right. Do you own a twenty-two caliber rifle? A rifle? Do you want to search the place? Or would that prejudice your case? For now, we're just asking, Jeff. All right, you asked. Do you own a rifle? Am I under arrest? No, you're not. Well, all right, then I'll tell you the truth. No, I do not own a rifle. Anything else I can do for you? Yeah. Stay home and take care of that sore leg. I still don't know if he meant to or not. 
Like I told you, he could throw a ball like a bullet, but you never could be sure who or what he's going to throw it at. When Jeff said he was quitting, did he give a reason? All I remember is he said he had to work longer hours, earn more money. Did he say what he wanted the money for? Said he wanted to buy himself a rifle. I asked him if he was going hunting. What did he say to that? He just looked right through me and said, maybe I am. I sure hope he can aim a rifle better than any can of baseball. Maybe he can. <laughs> search warrants and drove back to Jeff's apartment. Oh, it's you. Jeff ain't home. Gone. Not here. How long has he been gone? Packed up and run off the minute you folks left. Did he say where he was headed? He didn't even say, God bless me. He took my car. I couldn't stop him. Now, how am I going to get around without a car? Did you take a gun with him? A rifle? A gun? There's never been a gun in this house, Mr. Policeman. What kind of car do you drive? What kind? Blue. A Ford. A blue Ford. What model? Model? What year is the car? Well, I bought it second hand. I don't know how old it is. Well, do you know the license number? How would I know that? It isn't even paid for yet. Better get out an APB. I'll use the phone in the hall. Right. Now, Mrs. Beale, do you have any idea where your nephew is? Well, I know what you're talking about, officer. I heard you ask about that shooting, and you think Jeff did it. Yes, ma'am. We have a warrant for his arrest. It's all over. I tried. Lord knows I tried. The devil is in this house. That boy, he talked with the devil. There, that book right where he left it. He tore a page out before he threw it there on the table. Would you know why? Just tore a page out and stuffed it in his pocket and left this house. I wouldn't know. I never read evil books. We'd like to take the book with us, Mrs. Beale. It'll be returned after we finish our investigation. Don't you bring it back here. I beg your pardon? It belongs to the public library. Return it to them if you want. We'll do that. Maybe you won't. How's that? It's overdue. You'll have to pay a fine. We gave the apartment a thorough search. We failed to turn any kind of weapon. Before we left, we requested that the Buckram apartment be placed under surveillance. 1.55 p.m. The APB went out on Jeff Buckram and the Blue Ford. The only thing we had to go on was the book. We drove over to the branch library Jeff had checked it out from. The senior librarian was Alice Philbin. We talked to her in the coffee room. I don't like to receive visitors in the main room. It's difficult enough to maintain quiet without our setting a bad example. Yes, ma'am. Miss Philbin, do you know a Jeff Buckram? Jeff Buckram? Yes, I do. He's one of our best customers. Here's a book he borrowed. I believe it's one of yours. Oh, yes, Flaubert. It's overdue, Sergeant. There's a page missing. Page 67. It's been torn out. That's not like Jeff. How do you mean? Well, he loves books. Overdue, yes, that's Jeff. But vandalism, no. We'd like to know what was on that page. Can you help us? Well, I know you haven't come here just to return an overdue book and report a torn page. Jeff Buckram's in some kind of trouble. What is it? We'd like to talk to him. Do you have another copy of that book? Yes, I believe we do have one more copy if it's in. I'll check. We'd appreciate that. It's probably on the shelf. Flaubert isn't very big in this neighborhood. I was right. It's funny you should tear this particular page out. How's that, ma'am? It's about a boy who loves to kill things. Yes, ma'am. He starts out killing a little mouse, and finally he kills his father and mother. This is page 67. I'll read it to you. One morning, as he was going back along the curtain wall, he saw a fat pigeon on the top of the rampart preening itself in the sun. Julian stopped to look at it, and as there was a breach in this part of the wall, a fragment of stone lay ready to his hand. He swung his arm, and the stone brought down the bird, which fell like a lump into the moat. He dashed down after it, tearing himself in the briars and scouring everywhere, nimbler than a young dog. The pigeon its wings broken, hung quivering in the boughs of a privet. The obstinate life in it annoyed the child. He began to throttle it, and the bird's convulsions made his heart beat, filled him with a savage, passionate delight. When it stiffened for the last time, he felt that he would swoon. Thank you very much, Miss Philbin. Gentlemen. Yes, ma'am. Don't judge too soon. How do you mean? Do you know how it turns out, the Flaubert story? No, ma'am, we don't. It's one of his most famous short pieces. 
In the end, despite all he's done wrong, the boy turns out to be very good. Is that right? Oh, yes. It's the legend of St. Julian. Two forty six PM. We checked with the office. There were no results on the APB. Bill and I drove back to May Park Junior College. We wanted to talk to Ann Tipton again, Jeff Buckram's English teacher. She said she was familiar with the legend of St. Julian. Oh yes, I'm familiar with the legend of St. Julian. It's regarded as one of the most lucid and graphic stories ever written on the joy of killing. Was this a particular favorite story of Jeff Buckram's? I'm no psychiatrist, believe me. I guess I've been trying to talk like one. I'm really nothing but a junior college English teacher, and a rather frightened one at that. Well, why is that? I'm frightened for Jeff Buckram. And I'm afraid for Nancy Morton, too. Nancy Morton? Now, who's she? You might say she's Jeff's girlfriend, but I don't know that she'd agree with you. What do you mean by that? I doubt if Jeff has had much experience with sex. He's rebelling against everything, including sex, I imagine. He needs somebody to lean on, to idealize. Well, now, why didn't you tell us about the Morton girl before? I didn't think it was important before, and I just didn't want to get anyone involved. Now I'm beginning to get concerned for Nancy. Why is that? I think Jeff's trying to escape into some fantasy world, but he can't quite go it alone. He wants to take somebody with him. Something else about that world of his. Yes, ma'am. It must be a very dark place. Nancy Morton wasn't at school. We got her home address from the registrar's office. She appeared nervous, but she asked us in when we said we wanted to talk about Jeff Buckram. What is it? Is Jeff in some kind of trouble? We'd like to ask you a few questions, Miss Morton. How well do you know Jeff Buckram? He's just a friend. I'm not sure what the relationship is, really. We're not that friendly. What is it, anyway? What's happened to Jeff? We're trying to locate him, Miss Morton. Now, did you and Buckram spend much time together? No, nothing like that. He's never even tried to kiss me. He's just somebody I know, that's all. Is that so? I suppose every red-blooded college girl expects to be made a pass at sooner or later. Jeff's just different, that's all. How's he different? He just wants to talk or sit and look at me or out the window. He recites poetry sometimes, although I admit it's pretty gloomy stuff. You know, Baudelaire, Rambo, that stuff. We met in English Lit. He isn't too bad-looking, and he seems so intellectual. When did you see him last? Just a few minutes before you arrived. Where'd he go? I don't know. He didn't say. Did he seem nervous or upset? No. I didn't notice anything special. He's always sort of different. I wish you'd tell me what we're talking about. Has Jeff done something? We'd like to ask him some questions. Have you any idea where he might be? Any places he's known to frequent? Any friends he might visit? I don't know of any of his friends or even if he has any. I see. He seems so helpless. Like he had to have somebody to be near. But he didn't want any involvement. It was like he wanted somebody to own, but he didn't want anybody to own him or even touch him. All he believed in was people and books, people that don't exist. He believed in ideas that didn't have anything to do with anything real, anything in his own life. It was like he lived in a world made up of other people's words. All right, Miss Morton, thank you. You've been very helpful. Now, we just have one more question for you. Why did Buckram stop by here this afternoon? Do I have to tell you? Yes, ma'am, you do. He stopped by to pick up something. What was it? A gun. What kind of a gun? I don't know. I don't know anything about them. Did he get it? Yes. Can you tell us what the gun looked like? Was it a rifle, a pistol? It was a rifle. I know that much. Do you know what caliber? Caliber? That's the diameter of the bore. Now, did he say what caliber it was? I don't know. What could he have said? What would it sound like? 30, 30, 30-odd 30 six? Yes. He said 22. Does that mean anything? 4.15 p.m., Bill and I went back to the office. Nancy Morton's home was placed under surveillance. Homicide Gannon. Yeah, he's right here. This Friday? Yes, Miss Philbin. No, don't go near him. If he starts to leave, try and stall him. Leave him alone. That's right, we're on our way. Jeff Buckram is at the library. We drove as fast as the traffic would allow across town to the May Park Branch Library. Cops in a library? Aren't you out of your milieu? You're under arrest for murder. I've been patient too long. My memory is dead. All fears and all wrongs to the heavens have fled, while all my veins burst with a sickly thirst. That's Rimbaud, officer. And these are your rights. Listen to them. You have the right to remain silent. Murder. You have the right to remain I had no idea, Sergeant. Say, Cannon, we'll be 
Do you think Flaubert was the reason? No, ma'am, not the reason. Just the excuse. Ada Beale's car was found in an alley near the library. The 22 caliber rifle was in the trunk. It was checked out and confirmed by SID as the murder weapon. Jeff Buckram said he didn't want a lawyer. He shouldn't have done it. Shouldn't have done what? Turn that page up. That was wrong. So was murder. Well, Bear wasn't right, you understand. He didn't really know. Is that so? Wasn't like that at all. Wasn't like what? Like he said, full of delight. Savage and passionate delight. I didn't feel anything like that at all. What did you feel? I felt scared, like when you break something. Something that belongs to somebody else. And you know you gotta get caught. And you gotta get punished. I guess I'll never make it, will I? Make what? I guess I'll never be a saint like Julian and Flaubert. You got a long way to go. The story you have just seen is true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On July 16th, trial was held in Department 184, Superior Court of the State of California for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial. The you are about to see is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. Shave, shower, breakfast, take out the cans, mail, house payment. What's all that? That's it. What's it? I knew I'd forgotten something this morning, Joe. No water? I don't need it. They slide right down the old food chute. What are they for? My allergy. Feathers? Since I started on these little dolls, I can kiss a chicken. Well, that sounds like fun. No, no kidding, Joe. It was that truckload of parakeets we caught up with yesterday. <sighs> yeah. When I got home, Herm Sandberg was there. You remember Herm, don't you? Yeah. So Herm says they have these new pills. Boy, they're really great. Just great. You want proof? What kind of proof? Two days ago, I bought a parakeet for the kids. You got a bird in the house? We do. The kids are teaching it to talk. Is that right? Know what he says? No, what's he say? Take your pill. Take your pill. Friday, Yana, what's your workload like? How's your court picture? Well, court's clear, Skipper. The one thing we got working is this blonde bandit. He's got six jobs going on him now. Nothing definite yet, though. Turn your folder over to Leitner and Phillips. Let them work on it. I've got something else for you two right up your alley. A purse snatcher? Keep reading, Joe. You won't believe it. You're kidding. A purse snatching dog? How about that? A dog that snatches purses. Well, that's one for the book. And you're just the two who can handle it. You did such a good job with those parakeets, you're now our animal experts. Yeah, sure. Busy dog, isn't he? Seven jobs in two weeks. Better get on it right away. Yes, sir. A purse-snatching dog. That's what the man said, laddie. You mean lassie. studied all the crime reports. There were seven victims, all women, who reported their purses were stolen by a large dog. The descriptions of the dog varied. An eighth victim claimed her purse had been snatched by a large animal of some kind, but she could not positively state it was a dog. In each case, the victim had been waiting at a bus stop when the animal appeared out of nowhere, grabbed their purse, and disappeared. North Hollywood Park area. Yeah, look here. There's a bus route along here, with a stop here, here, and here, and two more here on this corner. Well, that puts a frame on the picture. Yeah. Bill, Joe, Skipper. The dog just grabbed another one. Here's the address. There goes the picture. What picture? It's not even 9 o'clock. All the other snatches were in the evening, between 5.30 and 7. Business is so good for him, maybe he's decided to work two shifts. <laughs> of the latest purse-snatching victim was a flower shop called The Cry of Sweet Pleasures and Stems of Dear Love. Ah, the powers of flowers draw you here. No, ma'am, we're police officers. Oh, how lovely. Are you Miss DeLeon? Nora Della DeLeone was my given name, my family name, but I changed it about an hour ago. It's so contrived, so out of it. <laughs> Just call me Agnes Hickey. Yes, ma'am. 
I'm not like some. I dig the fuzz. <laughs> After all, you're like the flowers yourselves. You have to live, too. Yes, ma'am. Did you report your purse stolen by a dog? No. The friendly fuzz in the lovely black and off-white wheel said he would make a report. That's his thing. Thing? Well, we all have a bag. And in every bag, we have a thing. My bag is flowers. My thing is to find homes for them. He said it was a dog. I didn't say that. Well, who said that? The friendly fuzz. Well, now, if you didn't say it was a dog, why would the officer report that it was? Who steals my purse steals my heart. For he is obviously in more need than I. And my heart goes out to those who need, for I have no needs, save to be needed. Well, now, that's a nice, gentle philosophy, lady. And if it's what you feel, why did you report the theft of your purse? But I didn't, love. You see, when the creature made off with it, I had no bread to pay the bus driver. And he didn't want to let me ride. See, collecting fares is his thing. Well, I felt I should ride now and pay later, so he called the man to put me off the bus, and that's when I explained to the friendly fuzz. Then you didn't register a complaint. I never complained. I love. Yeah, well, there are women who have complained that a dog snatched their purses. Just like all creatures, there are guide dogs and misguided dogs. Maybe you can help us find this misguided one. No, love. I must stay here in the cry of sweet pleasures and stems of dear love. Well, all we want is a description of the dog. Well, it had a tail, but so do ponies and cows and alligators. <laughs> So that's really no help, is it, love? What about color? How drab this world would be without color. Yes, it did have color. What color, miss? Brown, black, and yellow. How large would you say it was, Miss Delion? Agnes Hickey. Miss Hickey. Oh, a size two. Size two what? My daughter's a size two. She's about that high. Well, now, was that standing on its hind legs? Not as it was running. Did it stand on its hind legs to take your purse? I don't know. The lovely creature approached, said something, and when I turned, it was running off with my purse. It said something? Of course. It said, excuse me. The dog talked. Yes, love. In its own words, of course. What words? Oh, Ralph! <laughs>
2.15 p.m., Bill and I began to set up appointments with each of the ten prior victims of the purse-snatching animal. Six of them were available that afternoon. Three did not answer, and the other victim was out of town. We left the office to interview the first of the available six. Mrs. Emery Downey had been robbed while waiting for the bus. She could not identify the size, color, or breed of the dog who ran off with her purse. It had knocked her down at the time. 3.45 p.m. Mr. and Mrs. Lars Lowell had been waiting for the bus when Mrs. Lowell was attacked by the dog and her purse stolen at approximately 6.15 p.m. Yes, Sergeant, I got a very good look at him. It was an Airedale. No, Lars. Airedales have curly hair. He had straight hair. Well, how big was the animal, Mr. Lowell? About so gross. No, Lars, about so. I saw him. You were crying. I can see when I'm crying. Do you remember the color of the dog, Mr. Lowell? Yeah, black. Brown. Well, Airedales are brown and black. Could he have been both? It was not an Airedale. Cynthia, it was an Airedale. Don't listen to him, officers. I know an Airedale when I see one. To you, what? all dogs are Airedales. It was a collie. To you, all dogs are collies. It was a collie. The man knows I know a dog better than a collie. When Since I, I was a boy, I've had a little dog. Long 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 long. Long. As I turned, I saw this animal with my purse in his mouth leap into a passing automobile. Was the car driven by a man or a woman, Miss Holmes? I couldn't tell. 7.50 p.m. Our fourth and fifth interviews kept us working late. We had a confusing array of facts from all five victims we had talked to. All right, we got a dog that steals purses. Now, just add up these descriptions. The dog was big, he was small, he was medium. Yeah, I know. He was brown, he was black, he was yellow, he was gray, he was long-haired, short-haired, curly-haired. He looked like a Great Dane, a bloodhound, a bulldog, a mongrel, or a wolf. Or a collie. But, Joe, this is impossible. Nobody agrees even the slightest on what the animal even looks like. Where are you going to begin? Well, one thing's certain. He's still making off with women's purses. Beats me. I guess people just don't know one breed from another. Well, it's pretty tough, isn't it, when the dog's running off with your money to know what breed he is or care for that matter? Yeah, I know, but how are we going to nail him if we can't pin down a definite description of him? Well, look at it this way. Suppose we did. There are probably a million dogs in this city that would fit. You know, I'm getting so that every time I see a dog, I look the other way. You used to have one, didn't you? Old Fred? Sure, but there was a dog and a half. Great old boy. What happened? He died? Yeah, old age. Almost 17 when he passed on. Never had a dog like him. Probably never will again. Yeah, they can get to you, all right. Good old Fred. That's funny you should mention him. He was part of the family, you know. Great dog. What breed was he? Fred? Yeah. Oh, he was... Well, he was a kind of... You know, not a big dog, really. Not long hair, not exactly short. Uh, more like a beagle, maybe, or one of those funny dogs with the long ears, you know? Get in line. I just can't pull it up right now. I know what kind he was. Sure you do. Let's call it a day. Well, we might as well. There's nothing more we can do here. I'll finish up these reports and see you in the morning. You know, Joe? Yeah. Be just my luck. What's that? Probably be nothing but dog acts on TV all night. <laughs> June 9th, we checked with Bert Silver, a theatrical booking agent who specialized in animal acts. It was 9.40 a.m. Yes, boys, I'd say that's possible. Very possible. A dog can be trained to do anything. I got a dog act here. Homer Hoover and his pal. Homer taught pal to drive a unicycle. Imagine a fox terrier driving a unicycle. Isn't that beautiful? Homer says he could teach him to drive a car. Only smartest pal is he'd never pass the written exam for a license. According to witnesses, the dog's not a fox terrier. Couldn't be pal anyway. Him and Homer have been playing Australia for the last two years. Would you know offhand any dog that does answer the description? What description? He's big, but he's not too big. He's small, but he's not too small. We mean a description of his M.O. M.O. His method of operation. You know, he grabs a purse, then jumps into a car with it. Any smart dog can be trained to do that, Sergeant. Take Rin Tin Tin. There was a brilliant act. Of course, Rinty would never steal. Too much class that fella had. Then offhand, you wouldn't know of a dog around here who's been trained for a movie, maybe, to snatch purses. I know every animal act in California. I cannot get that one for you. I can give you a dog who can answer a telephone. Want me to call and let you hear a Labrador retriever on the other end? No, thanks. But what types of dogs are usually trained for such work, Mr. Silver? Depends. There are six different groups of dogs. The sporting group, non-sporting, working terriers, and so forth. In those groups, there are 113 different breeds. Now you can probably rule out a couple of groups and maybe concentrate on the sporting and working dogs. Setters, retrievers? Hounds and terriers and so forth. 
Take your shepherds, Danes, Newfoundlands, Tibetan Mastiffs, Schnauzers, or a cross between any of those. They all work good. I wonder if you could give us some names of animal trainers, Mr. Silver. Sure. It's a short list. Ten, twelve, maybe. But it won't do you any good. Oh, well, how's that? Training an animal to steal ladies' purses. Yes, sir. Good trainer sure ain't gonna train no dog to do that. For himself or nobody else. That right. Sure. A good dog man can make a hundred bucks a day working the movie studios. Yeah. Why bother to steal?
He took one look at him and he said, I don't know some of these birds. Better let me put your money in the hotel safe. All right, go on. Well, he phoned downstairs and he told the desk clerk to come up and bring a receipt. Here it is. It's a phony. So it was a guy I thought was a desk clerk. He don't work there at all. Yeah. Well, he's gone. So is Danny. So is my 43 bucks. Do you guys do anything to help me? Well, we'll fill out a complaint. That's a waste of time. Why do you say that? Filled out one of those things the last time. They got 20 bucks in. Same thing happened to you before. Oh, yeah. I'm one of those kind. I must be. What kind? I live, but I never learn. You. How about what? You go any place to relax? Is there such a place? Well, of course, Joe. Home. You got any plans? No. Why? How about coming out the house for dinner? Tonight? Good a time as any, isn't it? Well, I guess so. Boy, there's a football game on the old tube. I got a bottle of imported wine I've been saving since my birthday. Just sit around the whole evening and do nothing. You know, that sounds good. Great. Let's go. Wait a minute. Hadn't you better call Eileen? What for? Well, you invited me to dinner, didn't you? Of course I invited you just now, didn't you hear me? Then you want to let her know she's having company. But Joe, you're not company. I'd feel a lot better if you'd call her. Why? You know how Eileen feels about you. You she bet I do. You. I know that, and I'd like to keep it that way. Now, please, make the call. Boy, I don't know why you're making such a big fuss over this. All a woman has to do is set another place. And slice the meat a little thinner. <laughs> don't, don't be silly. Slice the meat a little thinner. That's a new one. All right. Who's this? Yeah? Where to? Oh, yeah, I forgot. Well, have a good time, but don't stay out past 11 o'clock. I know it's Friday, old boy, but that's check-in time anyway. Let me speak to your mother. The boys have got something on at the school, so we'll have nothing but peace and quiet. Sounds good. Hi. Yeah, just leave him now. One of those days, that's all. Look, honey, Joe's coming out to dinner and watch the ball game with me. Well, you know Joe. He's funny about these things. He wants to make it official. I know it's silly. Okay, you tell him that. She wants to talk to you. Hello, Eileen. Yes, if it's no trouble. You're sure? Well, I... What's that? Yeah. Well, that makes me feel a little better. Yes, we're leaving right now. Thanks. Goodbye, Eileen. What'd she say? It's okay. Well, I told you that, Joe. I mean, what did she say that made you feel better? Said she'd slice the meat a little thinner. Welcome to Eagle Rock. Yeah. What's the matter? Well, you parked across the driveway. Well, Joe, it's my own driveway. You notice anything different? What do you mean? The house. No, it looks just the same to me. You don't notice anything? No, should I? The house has been painted, Joe. Oh. What color did it used to be? Not color, Joe. Colors. Green and white. Oh, well, it's green and white now. It's a white house with green trim now. It was a green house with white trim then. Well, just the door is green. Well, Joe, that's what you call trim. Well, you really surprised me, not knowing what trim is. Yeah, well. Great colors, Joe. I'm going to stick with them. Uh-huh. Want to get rid of your coat and your iron? Good idea. There's a hanger for you. Thank you. Say, do you notice anything different inside the house? Well, I don't know. I haven't seen it yet. No, I mean right in the entry here. That sofa. Love seat, Joe. That was Eileen's mother's love seat. Oh. The wallpaper, Joe. The wallpaper. It's brand new. Oh. Well, you surprised me again. That's the first thing most people notice when they come in the house. That wallpaper just kind of jumps right out at them. Is that right? Yes, sir. Well, what can I pour you before dinner? Anything. Anything as long as you keep it short. That short is hardly worthwhile. Good, then we can eat first. What's the rush? Ball game doesn't start till 8 o'clock. Hi, stranger. Oh, that's better than a drink. Dinner's been in the oven for 20 minutes. Joe, do you want to sit over there? Fine, thank you, Eileen. You know, it's real good seeing you again. Do you know how long it's been? Oh, a few weeks, I guess. Last June. Oh, it can't be. It is. Well, they're making the week shorter than they used to. I looked it up. I'll get the salads. Now, you sit right down there, Joe. That's the seat of honor. All right. 
You notice anything different in here? That light fixture. Chandelier, Joe. No, we've had that for ten years. Gave the old one to Eileen's mother, in fact. Oh. The wallpaper, Joe. It's brand new. Oh, well, it's not the same as the stuff out in that other room there. Well, now, Joe, you wouldn't hang entry paper in your dining room, would you? You wouldn't do that, would you? No, I guess not. You bet I guess not. Well, Bill, you gotta understand, I live in an apartment. I wouldn't know about things like that. Oh, it's been a long time since I've lived like you. Say, tell me, what do they do for you apartment dwellers? Do they ever redecorate for you, give you new wallpaper like I do? Sure they do. You have to pay for it? Well, it depends on how long you've lived there. And if you haven't? Oh, you pay a little something. Makes sense. You really didn't notice, did you? Bill, we've worked together eight years, haven't we? Yeah, that's right. I've only been in this house three times. Well, now, Joe, you're not going to blame Eileen and me for that, are you? Well, no. How many times have we invited you out here to dinner? Nice, quiet evening. Meet some friendly people. Yeah, I appreciate that. Well, then I don't understand why you wouldn't notice. I guess I'm just not observant. <laughs> Better not let them know that downtown. You'd be out of work, wouldn't you? Oh, that reminds me, honey. Art Bonham just called. What did he want? Something he wants to talk to you about. Tonight? Yeah, he said it wouldn't take but a minute. Well, there goes an hour right there. Neighbor, Art's a nice guy, but he was born with an LP record in his mouth. Why didn't you tell him we were having company? Well, I did, but it was the wrong thing to say. How's that? Because Joe's a sergeant. Well, what's that got to do with anything? Art wants action, and he isn't sure he'll get it from you. So? So he says he wants to talk to your superior. <laughs> Sir, what do you think of this place? Well, to tell you the truth, I don't notice anything different in here. Oh, you're not supposed to. I haven't changed a thing in here. Even the drapes are the same. Oh, I see. Oh, I'm at the house, Joe, the house. It's a real nice house, Bill. What do you think I paid for it? I have no idea. Take a guess. I couldn't begin to. I don't mind telling you. Of course, that was 20 years ago, right after the war. 8500 Well, you got a real buy. That's two stories, you know. Yeah, I know. You could get more for it now, though. Oh, sure, good, but it's not for sale. You boys want anything else? No, thanks, dear. Just the old ball game. All right, I'll be in the kitchen if you need me. Let's see, we'll get the old set warmed up. Move her into position here. I like sitting nice and close, don't you, Joe? Fine, fine. Now, that looks good there. That's, that's pretty oh, good there. Right. Right. Yeah, that, that's fine. Yes, that's about right. Oh, I'm so... oh, sit down, Joe. Now, I know this is your favorite chair. Don't be silly. This is my favorite right here. This little rosewood number. I'm not going to sit in your favorite chair. Well, okay. Oh, you're going to love this chair. It's part of the love seat set. Eileen's mother's. Is that comfortable? Sure is. They don't build chairs like that anymore. I guess not. That's real horse hair. It's so. Perfect timing. Never missed a kickoff yet? This promises to be a whale of a game. The San Francisco 49ers and the Los Angeles Rams. Oh, the Rams are right up there in the weight department. But these 49ers edge the Rams about 10. That's your phone? Man. Just watch the game, Joe. Eileen will get it. Whoever it is, she'll tell him I'm not in. Relax. All set now. The ball's placed on the kitchen seat. We hope all of you are settled in a comfortable chair, ready to watch pro football at its very finest. Well, who do you think's going to pick up the marbles? I don't know. Those Rams look pretty good to me. I'll take Green Bay every time. Yeah, but they're playing the 49ers. Sure. Bill, that was Marnie Proud. She wants to talk to you. Did you tell her I wasn't in? No, I tried to, but she's coming over anyway. Now? Now. Try to be patient with her. What's the problem this time? Harry. Again? Mm -hmm. Try to be patient with her. Sure, sorry about the interruption, Joe, but I really think I ought to see her. Yeah, I understand. Neighbor lady, everything's a crisis in her life, so she brings it over here. You know how it is. No. Well, that's because you live in an apartment. Yes, Marty, he's here. Well, where is he? Because I want to talk to him. Right there, looking at television. Oh. Bill? The whole matter's in your hands. Now I have done everything humanly possible. Hi, Marnie. Just let me turn this down a little bit. I'd like you to meet Joe Friday, Marnie. Mrs. Prout, Joe. How do you do? Hello. Would you care to sit down? I'm in no mood to sit down. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know you had company. I'll just help Eileen with the dishes. Are you a police officer, too? Yes, ma'am. This is my partner, Sergeant Friday. Well, then there's good reason for you to stay, because your help will be needed. Yes, ma'am. Now, what seems to be the problem, Marnie? I want you to arrest Harry. Your husband. I'm sorry. I know it's a shock to hear it's gone that far, but you've got to lock him up. Now, you don't mean that. He snapped. Oh, Bill, I've seen it coming for a long time, but tonight he just snapped before my eyes. He snapped. Now, I saw Harry leaving for work this morning. It didn't look like there was anything wrong then. Oh, he's sly. 
That kind always is. They know how to hide their true nature. What's Harry hiding? Who knows? With a nut like him, you can only guess. Well, what did he do? He attacked me. He's insane. He's an insane man. Is that right? Oh, come on, Marnie. He threw an egg timer at me. Is that the act of a rational man, is it, Sergeant? A lot would depend on what made him do it. There. You see, Bill? Now, will you arrest him? You know I can't. Why not? I didn't see it happen. I just told you what happened. Were there any witnesses? We don't wash our dirty laundry in public. Well, then it's your word against his. Well, who are you going to believe, me or Harry? It's not up to me to believe either one of you. If you want to file a complaint, I'll tell you how to go about it. No, Bill. I want you to arrest Harry. Why me? Because Harry respects you. Look, Marnie, why don't you just go have a nice cup of coffee with Eileen? I appeal to you, Sergeant Friday. Well, let me ask you something, Miss Proud. Just where were you struck? Well, no place. I ducked just in time. Well, you see, that's the trouble. If somebody shoots at you, for instance, that's a felony, whether you're hit or not. But an egg timer wouldn't be considered a deadly weapon. It could be a misdemeanor assault, but since it missed you anyway... Oh, I guess that means nothing can be done. Not this time, Marnie. Well, suppose it happens again! Then you'll know what to do. What? Let him hit you. You get used to it. Well, now, what did we miss? I don't know. With a timeout down on the field and the score 10 to 3. 10 to 3? When did all that happen? I didn't see a thing. Sorry, Joe. I'll make sure we aren't interrupted again. Yeah. No, I mean it, Joe. We owe it to ourselves to get away from the job. We're going to have a nice, quiet evening to ourselves. With Art Bonham. Huh? Oh, yeah. Forgot. He didn't. Art Bonham, my partner, Joe Friday. How are you? Really good to see you, Sergeant. There are a lot of nice things about you from Bill. Is that right? What's the problem, Art? Look, you fellas are watching the ball game. Why don't we let this thing wait? Well, if it's not too important. Well, it is, sort of. It's a neighborhood situation. There's been a lot of unhappiness about it. Maybe you've already picked up a few rumbles. Can't say as I have, Art. Well, as long as I'm here anyway, it'll only take a minute, Bill. Okay, Joe? Yeah, sure. What is it? Well, it's the parking situation. You know how it is. This is our neighborhood. We all get along here. So what if we are a little casual in the way we park our cars? You mean you got a ticket? Actually, it was Vaya. That's the wife, Joe. She's only the latest on a long list. The whole street's up in arms. You sure nobody's complained? Not to me. I'm surprised. <laughs> Shouldn't be, though. The neighbors here do a lot of moaning, but when it comes to action, they leave that up to old Art. What was Vice added for? I got the ticket right here. Says she parked more than 18 inches from the curb. How do you like that? Did she? Probably. We all do. You know that, Bill. We've been doing it for months. You're still ahead. How's that? You've been getting away with it for months. <laughs> Funny. You know, this isn't for myself. Personally, I think you guys do a great job. Like the man says, I'd pay the two dollars. But Vi's really steamed up about it, and she's not alone. What were the other people cited for? Just a lot of nitpicking. Too far from the curb, too close to the hydrant, parked the wrong way around. Nitpicking. Those are all against the law, Art. True, no argument there. It's the application of the law I take issue with. I mean, this isn't downtown. We expect a little attitude from you fellas. Like how much? It's a matter of good judgment, which this guy on the ticket, whatever his name is, doesn't seem to have. Either he's trying to win his letter or he's behind in his quota. Well, there might have been complaints. Not in this neighborhood, Joe. We're just one big, happy family. Well, what are we going to do about this, Bill? I mean, this whole situation's getting ridiculous. Everybody in the Art. neighborhood... what? Pay the two dollars. this go on every night? They don't miss many. Well, they're neighbors, Joe. You're in a different position living in a tiny little apartment. Well, I'm not the only one in the building. Oh, maybe you know a few people by sight. A couple of them might be friends, but the rest are strangers. Yeah. None of them are neighbors. Well, you're a neighbor, too. I don't see you bothering anybody. No, you don't understand, Joe. I'm the friendly neighborhood cop. Uh-huh. Well, that's like being Lord Mayor. Everybody brings his troubles to you. Yeah, I noticed that. Most cases, all you can do is listen. So you do it. Because if you don't, yeah, well, you're a bad neighbor, Joe. I suppose. Isn't that a great chair?
course, you really can't get to be a neighbor till you're married. Is that right? Oh, yeah. You really ought to think about that, Joe. I have. What? What you said? You thinking about getting married? No, I'm not. You should, Joe. Well, maybe if I could find a nice girl like Eileen in a house like this for 8500 I might give it a go. Well, I certainly never thought I'd hear you say that. What? That you'd let a house stand in your way. That isn't what I said. You've always got an excuse, haven't you? Yeah, one. What's that? I just don't want to get married. Yes, you do. How do you know? It's written all over you. It is. You ought to see how you light up whenever I talk about the house, Eileen, the kids. Yeah, where are the kids tonight? Always want to change the subject, don't you? I try. You ought to think more about settling down. Look, Bill, it's a fine life for you and Eileen, and I'm all for it. But not for you. Not just now. And you don't care if you do or not. If I do or not what? Ever become a neighbor? Well, let me tell you, there's one time when I wouldn't want to be one. Oh, when's that? When the ball game's on. You suppose we could have a little sound now? Oh, yeah, I forgot about that. I'll turn it up. Yeah, that's fine, that's fine. I'm not available, Eileen, no matter who. All right. Doesn't matter who it is. I'll tell them. As far as this game has gone up to now, this is the biggest play so far, and it'll probably be the play of the game. Now watch this sensational pass on instant replay. It's good for 65 yards. You know, that's a great thing, that instant replay. It is tonight. Bill! Bill! It's Ruth Walker across the street. Somebody's trying to break into her house. Here he is. Ruth, what's the matter? Pardon? I can't hear you, Ruth. You'll have to speak louder. No, nobody can hear you outside. Yeah, that's better. Now, where's Mike? You're all alone, then. Where? The other patio window, just behind the hedge. Well, you sit tight. I'll take care of it. I'll be right there. I'll call it in. What are you going to do? Call for black and white. You going over there? Yeah, don't worry. Well, I never do. that a radio car to be sent to the address of the Walker home. At the same time, we asked that the officers be alerted to the fact that we were already in the area and investigating. Ready? Yeah, let's go. See at the station. You got him, huh, Bill? Nothing to worry about now, Ruth. It's all taken care of. Oh, that's a relief. But I just don't understand it. What's that? Well, how can it happen here? Well, what do you mean? Well, you know what I mean. No, I don't, Ruth. Well, you're a detective. You live right across the street from me. Well, I guess the prowler didn't know that. <laughs> well, that's the answer, Bill. It should be well known there's a policeman in the neighborhood. I could put a neon sign on the front lawn. Officer Gannon lives here. Just the same. Everybody would sleep better nights. Not everybody. Well, I don't know who wouldn't. Officer Gannon. <laughs> there are ten minutes left on the clock. Rams ball on their own 33-yard line. First and ten. 
This be a close game? How can you tell? The crowd, Joe, when there's that much excitement, a touchdown either way could do it. We could watch a couple of minutes and get the score before we go to Highland Park. No, I think we'd better be getting on over there, don't you? Yeah, I guess you're right. It's late. Thanks for having me, Eileen. I'm trying to remember when I had a meal that good. Think hard. When did you say I was here last? June. That's when. I suppose it'll be another five months before I see you again. Never that long. Be back as soon as we book that promise. I know. Good night, Joe. Good night and thanks. Now don't forget to lock the door. I'm sorry the evening got messed up. Oh, that's all right. It's not your fault. I suppose not. People got a problem. They got to tell it to somebody. Uh-huh. Isn't that your car down there? You know it is, Joe. Looks to me like you got a problem. What do you mean? Isn't that a traffic citation there in your windshield? What? That's what it looks like. Will you take a look at this for parking across the driveway? It's against the law. I know that, Joe, but my own driveway... It's still a 22500 EVC. Yes, I know, but my own driveway... The law shows no distinction. I know that, Joe. All I'm saying Bill, is... what? Pay the $2. seen is true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On January 20th, trial was held in Department 184, Superior Court of the State of California for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial. The suspect, who was wanted in connection with several other burglaries, was found guilty on four counts of burglary in the first degree. He was a half hour late when the phone rang. Only we can hang on to him for a while this time. And that's not even half a loaf, is it? No. I hope we can pin him. Let's play the string out slow and careful. Gentlemen. Come on over and sit down, Fox. Left my raincoat at home today. Got lucky. Found a parking spot right in front. Sit down. Is the hot seat? It'll do. You still driving that custom-built car? Not the green one. Sold it. Got a new one built. Real beauty. That right. Hey, I'm sorry I'm late. No, you're not. Now, now, Friday, don't start leaning on me. Nobody's leaning on you, Fox. I just get a little weary of the same old routine. You heard we were looking for you all last week, but like always, you took your sweet time about coming in. You pulled this stunt for over five years that we've been dealing with you. You wait till just before they shove that warrant down your throat and then you show, and when you do, you're always late. I'm a busy man, Friday. And I hope you and Gannon remember that I always cooperate. I come in on my own. I save the taxpayers' money. You don't have to serve the warrant. Now, I'd like to catch the last bout of the fights tonight, so let's get on to it, all right? Before we start, we want you to know your rights. Any statements you make can and will be used against you in a court of law. I know. I got nothing to hide. You also have the right to the presence of an attorney. If you cannot afford an attorney, one will be appointed without any charge. You know you're beautiful? I mean it. If I can't afford one. You understand your rights? Sure, I understand them. But I don't make a big thing of them. Only guilty people are worried about their rights. My lawyer's out of town till tomorrow, but I don't need him because I'm clean. Go ahead, take your best shots. Your name? Come on, you know my name, address, phone number, and the pressure in the tires on my car. And you know this routine almost as well as we do. If I ran my business this way, I'd go broke. Your name? George Fox. I live at 1620 Marinette Road, Pacific Palisades. Phone number 4637399. You don't have to give us your whole record, Fox. That'd take too long. Now, hold it. You're talking about the old George Fox. I cleaned up my act. If you guys looked at my record, you know I ain't been busted in over four years. No arrests, but you've been questioned 11 times during those four years. That proves what I'm saying. I'm being rousted by you guys. You know better than that. Don't blow your cool. I ain't so. I came in under my own steam, didn't I? With a little shove from that warrant. Don't be silly. It's great for my business. I'm a celebrity. So the papers put it on the front page. George Fox questioned by cops. You can't buy an ad like that. 
You see, Gannon, I'm a legitimate businessman. One of the companies I own that puts vending machines in big factories. Hot and cold food, cigarettes, coffee, fruit, all kinds of machines. Okay, so I'm trying to sell a guy at a factory on putting in my machines. He sees that stuff in the papers. He figures I'm still a muscle guy. So he gets scared and he signs up. You don't use muscle anymore, though. Oh, I don't have to. Look, it ain't how tough you are that counts. It's how tough people think you are. They think I'm still a muscle bum like in the old days. I don't tell them no, so they're glad to do business with me. That vending machine business, they tell us that's one the organization is in all over the country. That a fact? You wouldn't know about that. Just what I see in the papers and on TV, that's all I ever knew. You've got friends in the organization, haven't you? I've got all kinds of friends. But before you get any ideas, they ain't in my company. I'm a legitimate businessman, and I got no partners. Must be nice not taking orders from anybody. Oh, I take orders. You do? Sure, from my customers. They push me around, but that's part of the business. Like I said before, I cleaned up my act. You guys are talking to the new George Fox. Why don't you knock it off, George? Knock what off? Don't you ever sing a new song? Is that the only one you know? Every time you're brought in, you go into that same tired routine. The new George Fox. Well, in our book, you're still the same guy. The same George Fox who did three long terms in the joint, and you didn't do them for jaywalking. You went to Q for armed robbery and twice for assault with a deadly weapon. So you haven't been arrested in over four years. Nobody down here brought you in 11 times to question you just because they like to see you. They brought you in to ask you about murder, shakedowns, and strong arm rackets. They didn't arrest you because they couldn't, and you know why they couldn't. Because in two cases, the only witness against you suddenly wound up dead, and in the others, witnesses were afraid to testify. So don't start telling us about the new George Fox. If you're so clean, where you been since we started looking for you a week ago on a Boy Scout camping trip? Nice try. You're pretty good. You can see why he made sergeant. Meaning? Well, we all know why he made that speech. He was trying to get me sore. If you guys can get me to blow my top, maybe I'll spill things you don't know. Won't work. I've been this route before. You want information for me? Come and get it. Ask me questions. I just did, Fox, and I want an answer. Where you been this last week? On my boat, fishing. Any law against that? Where'd you go? Off Catalina. You guys ought to do that every couple of months. Great for your nerves. Who was on the boat with you? Nobody. I carry enough food and I got an extra tank of gas, so I never put into shore from the time I left till I got back to the marina. Go prove I'm lying. The last four years, nobody seems to be able to prove anything against you. Not because I'm smart, because I'm clean. Those vending machines of yours, any of them sell Bibles? Ain't a bad idea. Any more questions? A few. Tell us about him, George. Who's this jughead? That mean you don't know him? Maybe I know his name. I'll help you. Paul Carter. Paul Carter. Paul Carter. Sorry, pal. What else you guys got on your mind? Oh, let's not quit on Paul Carter so fast. I hate to see you wasting your time. I'm just trying to help you. We appreciate that. We sure do, George, because the only way we can operate effectively is with the cooperation of decent law-abiding citizens. Look, you don't want to believe I'm straight. That's your business. But I'm telling you, I don't know that creep. You could be mistaken. That goes for you guys, too. We make them. And I got a big flash for you. You guys make a lot more mistakes than me. That's why I'm wearing the $300 suit and you got baggy pants. You know how much I paid in taxes last year? More than both of you jokers made. That right. Now quit leaning on me like I'm a two-bit petty larceny bum. I came here on my own because I'm clean. You ask me about that creep and I tell you. What more can I do? Try telling the truth. Hey, wait a minute. Now I get it. We thought you might. That loving creep, whoever he is, he's the one who called you and put the loving rap on me, right? He have any reason to? How could he have a reason? I don't know the stinking bum. If he says I do, bring him in here and let him say it to my face. Go ahead, bring him in. I'll wait. Just can't stand it when somebody calls you bluff, can you? You seem pretty sure we can't bring in Paul Carter. I don't know what cards you're holding, but it looks to me like you're trying to win a pot with a pair of deuces. We heard about how smart you are. I guess that's why they call you Foxy. Go bet your loving bundle on that. As a matter of fact, George, you're right. We can't bring in Paul Carter. He's missing. No, that's too bad. Why? What difference does it make if you don't know him? I'm a soft-hearted slob. I hate to see any guy in trouble. What makes you think Paul Carter's in trouble? He's missing. That means he's either on the lam, or maybe he got rolled and belted on the head and don't know who he is. And that, my good friend, Sergeant, puts me one up on you. Is that right? Go figure it. You're giving me information, but you ain't getting any back. Go on. All that stuff about this car bomb being missing. You know, I didn't know nothing about it until you told me. 
Now, your boss might take a dim view of the way you're questioning me. It'll be in the papers and on TV by tomorrow morning, Fox. We're asking the public to help us locate him. And that's why you wanted to talk to me, huh? To see if I could help you? I'm the public? Something like that. You guys ain't even got a pair of deuces. Tracy didn't even recall talking to Paul Carter the night before. 
He told Carter the deal was impossible. Carter argued. When Tracy refused to consider it, Carter played his trump card. He said the money was yours. Mine? What is it with you guys? Get off my back, will you? Stop trying to hang me on a phony rap. I suppose you got five G's in the folder of yours and you're going to say it's the same money I gave Carter. Take it easy, Fox. I ain't seen Carter in a year and I never heard of this other bum. We don't believe you. Who cares what you believe? Where would I get five G's in cash? I'm a legitimate businessman. Check my bank account. See if I took out any five G's. I never did and I don't walk around with that kind of money in my pocket. You got nothing on me except a lot of lies and you know how I'm going to prove their lies? By making that crummy rat fink Paul Carter talk. You know where he is? If you can't find him, I will. Wherever he is. I got friends all over the country. You mean the organization? No, I mean friends. Good friends. Maybe one of them lent you that $5,000. There was no $5,000. We'll find that dirty loving creep, I guarantee you. And when we do, I'll make him talk. Is that what happened to the witnesses in those other cases? Never mind those other cases. We're talking about Carter. I just want to hear him say I gave him that loot. You do. You heard me. The minute Carter left Tom Tracy's office, Tracy called us in case Carter came back. Which he did the following morning. Tracy, I had to come back. Carter, I told you yesterday that no stock in the company is for sale, and that's fine. I told that to my people, but they won't take the $5,000 back. That's not my problem. Yes, it is. It's your problem and mine. You don't know my people. If you don't go through with the deal, they'll kill both of us. I doubt they'd go that far. Tracy, hear me good. They killed a lot of people already when they didn't play ball their way. I don't want to get killed. I did the best I could. This whole thing was their idea. When I told my people you were so drunk I had to drive you home, they gave me the money and made me come to you with that story. You gotta be kidding. You really gotta be kidding. We don't think so. I do. Tell me what you think you got there. The beginning of an extortion. The beginning? Man, I can't wait to see what you got for a finish. You got nothing there. We think we do. Let me tell you what you got. You got a photograph of some bum calls himself Paul Carter and me standing beside him. You got this bum's word that I ponied up five big ones so he could pick up a nightclub for me. Now you try taking that into court and you'll end up the two biggest dummies in the city. You just heard part one, George. Listen to part two. You know, I told you I want to catch that last bout of the fights. Part two. subject's closed as far as I'm concerned. Well, it's not closed as far as my people are concerned. It's too bad for both of us. I told you, you and me are marked right now. What do you mean, marked? They're gonna kill us both if you don't make good on the deal. I keep telling you, there never was any deal. All right, do this for me. Do what? Talk to my people. I'm not talking to anyone, Carter. That's fine. Just talk to them on the phone. Get me off the hook. You can do that much, can't you? Why don't you leave town? Where would I go? San Francisco, New York, any place. You've got that 5000 they gave you. That'd be real smart, wouldn't it? They'd run me down and quick. You know better than to say that. You don't run away from the syndicate. They'd flatten me any place I tried to go. Now, I'm going to call. you got to get my neck off the block. you got to do that. They won't listen to me anymore. Maybe they'll believe you. I'm fascinated. You might be. Yeah? Tracy won't believe me. Talk to him. Hello, who's this? Never mind who's this. You listen, Buckethead, and listen hard. I'm done with the small talk, you hear me? Next time you open your mouth to me, it'll be with a barrel of a 45 in it. I'll blow your rotten, stinking head off. I'll put enough lead in your gut, you'll think you're a toy soldier, you hear me? Now you draw up the papers for that 2%, and you turn them over to Carter there, and you do it right now. What's all that supposed to be about? You tell us you're the big man that was doing all the talking and the threatening. Me? Now you're trying to hang that jazz on me? You know this is insulting. I came in here on my own and you guys positively insult me. That wasn't you making all that loud talk. Sounds a little like me, I'll admit. But that guy, whoever he is, it ain't me. We know it isn't so to you. Where's your proof, genius? I didn't hear no names mentioned, did you? Only them same two bums, Tracy and that creep, what's his name, Carter. 
Is this the end of your show? I gotta get going. I'm late now. Stay for the last act, Fox. Listen to part three. This is four days later. Same office, same telephone. Just one man now. Tom Tracy. Hello. Tom Tracy. Who's this? Somebody who's interested in your future. What do you mean? You heard me. This is the last call to dinner, Tracy. The fun and games are over. I know you got a wife and family, and I know you don't want to see him alone in the world, so get to it. Get that 2% deal drawn up, and let's call it things to do today, understand? Who am I talking to? You're a lifesaver, punk, if you do what you're told. I never made any deal for 2%, and I don't like being threatened. You're wrong twice, big money. You made a deal, and you know it. And you're not being threatened, you're being promised. I want those papers, and I want them today, or you don't live to see the 6 o'clock news on television. You have anything to do with Paul Carter? He's been bypassed, and so is Fox. You're dealing with me now, punk. You've got till 6 o'clock tonight, and then it's gonna be hats and horns. You're on, George. Who is that guy? Am I supposed to know him, too? You know him. Got a picture of him you want me to look at? You know the meaning of the word extortion, Fox. It comes from a couple of Latin words. It means to twist out. Taking something from somebody by twisting or squeezing him, using force or the threat of force. All right, you went to school. Penalties, five to 15 years. What's all this got to do with me? That was you on this second piece of tape we played. We think the man who just burned you on that last piece was one of your boss men, Jack Rock. Jack Rock burned me? You're way off base. I heard the name Fox mentioned, but that don't prove up. That don't prove up for eight cents. Check your city guide. There's a million foxes. As far as that cruddy tape you got, anybody can make like somebody else's voice. You got ten pounds of air, and that's all you got if you got that. Go on. I ain't a lawyer, but I know you guys can't go bugging offices and phones. That's not admissible in court. You're right, George. You ain't no lawyer. Tom Tracy gave us written permission to put a concealed microphone and recorder in his office and to tap his phone for the purpose of gathering evidence of the commission of a crime. That makes it as legal as eating a hot dog at the ball game. You know what this is? comes from a machine called a voice printer. It picks up sound vibrations from the voice and records them on paper. So? That particular print was made from your voice on the tape that was recorded with your permission when you were in here for questioning last year. So? So this. No two people have exactly the identical voice qualities. Each person's voice print is as unique as his fingerprints. Take a look at this one, Fox. That one was made from the tape we've been listening to. You don't have to be an expert to see they compare. Now, George, talk to us. seen is true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On August 12th, trial was held in Department 189, Superior Court of the State of California for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial. Under further interrogation, the suspect George Fox admitted having shot and killed Paul Carter. He led officers to a location on the Mojave Desert where he had buried Paul Carter's body. Intensive investigation failed to prove the other voice on the tape recording was that of Jack Rock. Fox steadfastly refused to implicate Jack Rock or anyone else who might have been involved in the attempted extortion of Tom Tracy. George Fox was tried and convicted on a charge of murder in the first degree. Murder in the first degree is punishable by death in the gas chamber or confinement in the state prison for 